Hello and welcome to class today. Peter, it's good to be with you and the students. Roger and I are grateful for the opportunity to study with you today. Our lesson is going to be from lesson number six, why we need God, what God did, and what we must do. And this is a very fundamental, important lesson that we want to really try to impress upon everyone uh, the need for study in this area. Before we begin, I'm going to get Roger to lead us in prayer. And then we will begin point number one, why do we need God? Brother Roger. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your plan of salvation that you've made available to us so that we might know you and know Christ and know forgiveness and know the Christian life. We pray that you be with Brother Mike and myself and those who are listening today, that we will study and learn together and seek to do your will in all things. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Roger, and thank you for being a part of our class today. Let's jump into our lesson and look at point number one, why do we need God? And this is a fair question, and it's really fundamental to everything that we're talking about in the realm of redemption. And so number one, why we need God, there is a universal problem of sin. And of course, you go back and look at Genesis chapters one and two, and we read about the creation of man. And God did not make us, that being human beings, as robots, but rather God gave each of us the ability to make choices in life. And so when God made the crown of his creation, Adam and Eve, he gave them the ability to choose, to make choices. And you remember in chapter 2, in verses 15 through 17, God had told them they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. And of course, we come to chapter 3, the serpent appears on the scene, Mother Eve was deceived, and likewise, Adam also transgressed the law of God or sin. They violated that divine commandment. They were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate it. As a result of that, man died spiritually and began to die physically. And that's something that we need to understand. Mankind made the choice, that being Adam and Eve, made the choice to violate God's law. And when he did that, when the first couple did that, there were consequences to that. One of the things that I want to share very quickly uh, along those lines is the fact that when man sinned in the garden, God immediately began putting into place his redemptive plan. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Brother Roger, I know you got something to add. Well, I wanted to speak briefly about you made the point you made that we have a choice uh, sometimes we reference Joshua 24, 15, you know, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But he was talking to the children of Israel, basically saying, you know, if serving God is evil, you, and, and basically he's saying, you, you have a choice here too, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And there are people that believe that we do, we're, we are dead spiritually because of Adam's sin. And, of course, in Genesis chapter 3, we have no people before that. But Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Try. And so you can't, you know, Romans 5, 12 is clear that death spread to all men, not because Adam sinned. Right. But because all sin and people have this idea that, well, we're guilty of Adam's sin or the, we're not. That's right. As a matter of fact, look in light of that. Look at it at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. Ezekiel, the prophet, I think, makes a statement that relates to what Brother Roger just said. You remember in Ezekiel, chapter 18, in verse four. Ezekiel said in the long ago, the soul who sins shall die. Sin is a violation of God's law based on 1 John chapter 3, 
in verse 4. But look at verse number 20. In verse 20, Ezekiel said, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. And so really what Ezekiel is saying is we are all individually accountable to God but because all, as Roger read a minute ago, have sinned. Uh, we're not bearing the sin of our father. Now, we might bear the consequences of actions that our fathers or family members have, uh, some of the things that they've done in the past. We may ultimately reap some consequences, but we don't bear their sin. Uh, we're not born sinners, as some teach and believe today. And that's a great point. Matter of fact, in Romans, look at Romans chapter 3 for a minute. You remember in Romans chapter 1, Paul indicted the Gentile world as being under sin. In chapter 2, he turned to the Jewish world and said that they too were under sin. And so then in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, here's what Paul said, what then, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, now listen to him, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then drop down and look at verse 23. In verse 23, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so man sinned in the garden, and because of that sin, man began to die both physically and, more importantly, man died spiritually. And so you have in Genesis chapter 3 at verse 15, the unveiling of God's redemptive plan, that is, how God could bring man back to fellowship with himself. Now, let's think for a moment or two about the condemnation of mankind. God's the one who created us, but because of sin, there is a penalty imposed, or there is a penalty on mankind. The penalty is spiritual death. Since we're in the book of Romans, turn over to Romans chapter 6 for a minute. Look at Romans, the sixth chapter, down in verse 23. Here's what Paul said. For the wages of sin is death. And the death that he's speaking of here is spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's the one that devised a redemptive plan. That plan was in place before he ever created the world. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment or two. But to just really impress upon all of us, when the question is asked, why do we need God? The fundamental answer is, sin. It's because of sin and the effects of sin. And sin is a universal problem. And I would also add, it is an undeniable problem. Everywhere we look, we see sin ravaging mankind. Brother Roger? I was looking again at Romans chapter 3, and I the, the New American Standard reads in verse 19, the latter part of the verse says, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. How does the New King James read there? The latter uh, part of verse 19. Uh, <clears throat> now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So, so yeah. So that brings back the idea that everyone who sins is guilty, and yet we have a choice as to what right. we will do with regard to what we're going to talk about in a moment and what God did for us. We're not, we're not unable to be saved no matter who we are. That's right. We're and also all guilty. That's right. And, and to understand that when God created man, you know, sometimes we use a word that describes the all-knowing power of God. That word is omniscience. 
But the idea is God is all-knowing. And so God, in his infinite knowledge and wisdom, realized that in giving man the ability to make choices, that at some point in time, man would sin or violate his law, make the wrong choice. And so in light of that, he would need a redeemer. God then had a plan in place. So when Adam and Eve transgressed his command in the garden, immediately he began unveiling that plan for lost mankind. And the reason was so that he could have fellowship with us. That was the design. All right, so let's move from that and think about in the second place what God did for us, the promise of salvation. And number one, it entails a plan. I mentioned a moment ago that God, in his infinite wisdom, had this plan in place before he ever laid the foundation of the world. Let me give you a couple of verses. Let's look, first of all, at Ephesians chapter 1. Paul in Ephesians 1 makes it abundantly clear that God had a plan in place that plan included his son, and his son would die for sin. And so the gist of Romans chapter, or rather Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3, down through about verse 7, the gist is that God, in his plan, decreed that he would save all who were in Christ. So listen to what he said, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. That is, he chose to save those who are in Christ. Well, when did he do that? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now I want to back up and look specifically at verses four and five for a minute. God chose to save people before he ever made the world, he chose to save them in Christ Jesus. Sometimes people will take this term predestined in verse 5 and say that God has predetermined or predestined to save certain people and others will be lost. He's not talking about individually predestinating people's salvation or condemnation. But what he is saying is that God predetermined before he ever made man or the world to save people in his son, Jesus Christ. He's talking about a class of people here. The class of people that he will save are those who have responded in faith and obedience to the gospel of Christ. Uh, Brother Roger, did you want to add to that? God predestined a people, not a certain number like you said if you go back to romans 3 19 if all the world is guilty before god or accountable to god then you didn't then if you're if you're predestined to be lost that verse doesn't mean anything one way or the other that's right that's but right it, but looking here in verse 13 of ephesians 1 paul said speaking of christ in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed with him, sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you, they heard the word, they believed it, they could have also refused to believe it. That's it. Well, matter of fact, uh, by way of implication in verse 13, when Paul said, uh, in verse 13, in him you also believed or trusted after you heard right. the word of truth. And this goes back to 
the invitation is open to all. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. But you remember, matter of fact, there's a principle here. I want you to look at, since Brother Roger made this point, go back and look with me at John chapter 6 for a minute. In John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45, Jesus has been identifying himself in this context as the bread of life, that living bread that came down from heaven. And you remember in verse 44, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now look at verse 45. Jesus said, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so here you have, here you have Jesus saying that, when we hear the gospel of Christ or hear that message and respond with an obedient faith, we hear it, we learn the truth, we believe the truth, and we obey the truth. And that's what I think Paul is saying in Ephesians 1 in verse 13 as well. And that goes back to uh, the choices we make in this life. And in Christ Jesus, salvation is offered. But since we're in the book of Ephesians, let's just turn over to chapter two for a minute. Because <clears throat> God's redemptive plan, as you well know, involved the cross. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, number one, he shed his blood. We are redeemed by that blood. But we're also said to be reconciled and that reconciliation takes place in his body. You remember in Ephesians 2, verse 11, Paul here describes the state of the Gentile world in verses 11 and 12, and says in verse 12 that those who are outside a covenant relationship with God, they have no hope and they are without God in the world. But look at verse 13. Paul said, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So what is it that makes the difference in the life of someone who's living in sin? The difference is the blood of Christ. And that blood was shed on Calvary for our sins. And the shedding of that blood went all the way back to Adam and Eve and the first couple. Because ultimately, everyone that will be saved will be saved by the same thing. And that's the blood of Jesus. And that's a very important point. Uh, Roger? I had a, another point here. You can take this idea of salvation in different directions, but there are people that think that, well, they're just not, they can't be saved that in, in their mindset is I've just been, I've just done too many wrong things. You know, God won't save me. And, and I think of Saul of Tarsus who killed Christians um, and people like that. And this is not in your lesson, but in second Corinthians chapter five verses, uh, verses 18 and 19, Paul says something about salvation and he's talking about a ministry of reconciliation. And, and I was reading this the other day and it just kind of hit me. I'd read it before, but I wanted to reiterate it. Now, all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And we know that the, that that doesn't mean that the whole world is saved, but the whole world could be if they wanted to be. That's right. He, you know, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's not a person who can't be saved, and yet a person can choose to, to reject it. But anybody can choose to accept it. That's right. That's right. And the basis of God's redemptive plan, it goes back, to his great love and his grace that has been that has been 
shown to the entirety of the human family. As a matter of fact, when we talk about his plan, it goes hand in hand with his purpose. And the idea here is that God desires the salvation of all people. Let's look at, let's look for a minute at 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Beginning in verse 3, Paul has been talking about offering prayers for those who are in authoritative positions. In verse 3, he said, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now look at verse 4. Who desires all men, that's both male and female, humankind. He desires all men to be saved. All right, how then does a person he enjoys salvation. Here it is. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, going back to what Jesus said in John 6, it's written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and learned of the Father comes to me. So truth and salvation go hand in hand. Now look at verse 5. Paul said, and this goes back to what Brother Roger read a moment ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Think about it like this. Mankind's on one side. God's on the other side. And Jesus stepped between man and God, and Jesus was the God-man. And Jesus died Matter of fact, Paul said he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Through his redeeming work, Jesus standing in the middle on the cross brought lost man and God together. He mediated between the two parties, brought the two parties together, reconciled them together. And in Ephesians 2 at verse 16, Paul said that he reconciled both Jew and Gentile in one body under God through the cross. And that one body is this church. Roger. I hope that in our teaching that we are balanced in what we're talking about today, that in Romans five and verse six, and do you know that Christ died for the ungodly. Here we were totally undone, unable to save ourselves, lost, condemned, hopeless. Right. And if it had not been for the death of Christ and the shedding of his blood, we'd still be in that condition. That's right. And we certainly need to give God all the credit and the glory for what he did, because at times, you know, it's we, we seem to emphasize, well, we have to obey Christ. We have to obey the Lord but it would do us no good to obey him if he hadn't done something in the first place. That's in right. Romans 5 and verse 6 says, while we were still helpless That's at right. the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And, and, I, and I like that translation because without Christ and his redemptive plan, we would be lost. Right. There was nothing that we could do to save ourselves. Right. But rather, it took God working on our behalf so that we might enjoy uh, the idea of redemption is to buy back. And so through the shedding of Jesus's blood, he bought back what had been lost. And that is he bought our salvation in Ephesians two in verse four. You remember, Paul said, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now look at verse five. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest anyone should boast. And so we attribute our salvation not to ourselves, but to Almighty God. You might think about it like this. On the one side, we read about what God has done for us. And then on the other side of the ledger, what we must do to enjoy those blessings. And when we obey the will of God, we're not earning our salvation. We're not putting, uh, we're not making God in debt to us for anything. It's just through his uh, unmerited goodness and kindness that he has given us the opportunity to enjoy fellowship with him. Were you going to say something, Roger? I was just thinking how people take uh, verse 8, verses 8 and 9, and try to say we don't have to do anything. I know that that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, or according to Romans 10, 17. I wouldn't know about faith. I wouldn't understand the importance of faith if God had not revealed that to us. That's, so that's... in one sense, faith is a gift to us, but it is also an action on our part. Uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. You have to believe in Christ. You have to believe in God. But we wouldn't know anything about that if God had not acted first. That's right. And I, I what Roger, what he said a minute ago is really important. And I want us to think about that in more detail in just a second when it comes to the idea of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, when people say you can't do anything. Well, on the redemptive side of the ledger, based upon what God did for us, there's nothing that I could do to redeem myself. No, mm -hmm. but that doesn't negate the fact that there are things that I must do to become the recipient of those blessings. And so We'll talk about that. Let's look at our third point now. What must we do to be saved? And that's an important question. And so first, the person of salvation, and we know that the person of salvation is Jesus Christ. You remember, let me just give you a couple of verses, and then we're going to move on because we don't just have a lot of time today. But go back and look at Matthew, the first chapter. You remember when the angel told Joseph that Mary was going to bring forth a son, and you, you recall that the angel said in the long ago that before they came together, verse 18, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit, and then down in verse 20, the Bible says that as Joseph thought about these things, the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 21, she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Savior of the world, isn't he? Yes. You recall in, you recall in John chapter 1, when John the Baptist saw Jesus on one occasion, listen to what John said. Verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus was God's Lamb who died on Calvary. Uh, we could talk about the Passover Lamb back in Exodus 12, and you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul said that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And so through the finished work of Christ, we have the opportunity to enjoy salvation. Roger, I'm sorry. No, I didn't have anything. Okay, okay. Uh, let me give you one other verse very quickly. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. That's not on the screen, is it? No, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and this passage just came to mind, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to use it in addition to what we have because I think it's a really good verse stressing the work of Christ. In 1 Peter 3, verse 18, Peter said, Christ also suffered once for sins, 
Now think about that. Jesus paid one price for sin. All those uh, Old Testament sacrifices that were made in the period of the patriarchs under the law of Moses, none of those blood sacrifices was sufficient to save man from sin. Jesus paid the price once and for all. And so it says that Christ also suffered once for sins. The just, that's Jesus. For the unjust, that's us. Well, why did he do that? Here it is. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So Jesus, here again, uh, paid the price for sin. Now let's talk about this plan for a minute. God has provided a plan for us to be saved. And when we comply with this, this plan, this divine plan, we become the recipients of all these spiritual blessings. Now, just a moment ago, you remember Brother Roger read from Ephesians 2 in verses 8 and 9. And he said that there are people in the world today that will say, well, you don't have to do anything. It's all by grace. And sometimes you'll hear people say, it's, all, it's, it's by grace alone. Others will say it's by faith alone. Well, my question would be, which is it? Well, grace and faith work together, don't they? But look at, let's go back and look at Acts chapter 2 very quickly. I want to I want to show you something here about this plan. You remember in the second chapter of Acts, Peter and the apostles are making a presentation of the crucifixion, death, resurrection, and coronation of Jesus in heaven. He died for our sins. He was buried, raised again. And Peter said in verse 32 that this Jesus, God has raised up of which we are witnesses. And so when they heard that, down in verse 36, the Bible says that Peter then said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now look at verse 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Well, what did they hear? They heard the gospel. And how does faith come? In our lesson today, Romans 10, 17, under subpoint number three, <coughs> excuse me, says we must hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, there are people today, and I'm sure where you live, you'll hear people saying there's nothing you can do. You don't have to do anything to be saved. All right, when they asked that question, men and brethren, what shall we do? What did Peter say? Did Peter say to them, where'd you, where, where'd you ever get the idea you have to do something? Why would you think you've got to do anything? Is that what he said? No, look at what he said. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? Why do we need to be baptized into Jesus Christ? Here it is. For the remission of sins. And the idea is we're baptized into Christ so that we might enjoy forgiveness of sins. In other words, through faith, repentance, and baptism, we then are said to enjoy the remission of sins. Now, you remember... Roger read a moment ago from Mark 16, verse 16, and I think Mark 16 is a, is a parallel passage to Acts chapter 2. Look at Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. Let's just read it together. In verse 15, Jesus had given the marching orders to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus said, he who believes, number one, and is baptized, number two, will be saved, number three. Now, when somebody tells you, you don't have to do anything, 
or you don't have to be baptized into Christ, you remind them that Jesus said that those who believe and are baptized are then what? They're saved, aren't they? Now, let me ask this question. Did Jesus know what he was talking about? He had all authority, didn't he? And didn't God the Father say in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, we're to hear him? So Jesus said, we believe, we're baptized, and we're saved. Peter said, we believe, we repent, and we enjoy forgiveness or salvation. That's what the Bible says. So is there something that I must do to appropriate all those spiritual blessings in Christ? Well, the answer is yes. What do I have to do? I've got to obey the gospel, don't I? Brother Roger. I was just thinking about maybe people talk about being saved by faith only. There's no there's no such thing as anybody being saved or, or responding to God by faith alone. When you read the 11th chapter of Hebrews, you have that list of people that by faith, they all did something. So faith is something that acts on what it knows or what it has heard. And I was thinking about repentance. Maybe the problem people have with baptism is not baptism, but a problem of faith and a problem of repentance. Right. They they don't you don't tell me you believe the Bible if you if you reject something that the Bible clearly teaches. That's, that's not right. faith. That's not faith at all. That's unbelief. And right. and then the repentance aspect in Matthew 3, 2, John preached it. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus preached it. We read repentance in Acts 2 38. It's in Acts 3 19. Paul preached it on Mars Hill. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. But if we really believe, really and truly believe, we will do anything God wants us to do. You know what, Roger? That's a, I think that's a great point. And to illustrate what Roger is saying, I want to just use an example in Luke chapter 5. And it's the account of Peter and the disciples. You remember they had been out fishing all night. And according to Luke, they were cleaning everything up, washing their nets. They had been out on the sea all night. They hadn't caught anything. And you remember Jesus Jesus uh, told them to launch out into the deep and let down their nets for a catch. That's found in verse 4 of chapter 5. Now, Peter was an experienced fisherman. And so you remember Peter said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, Jesus, by trade, was a carpenter, wasn't he? Yes. What do you know about fishing? Well, Peter was an experienced fisherman. He's been out. They've been out fishing all night long, haven't caught a thing. Jesus told them to launch out into the deep, let down their nets for a catch. All right, did it take faith for Peter to respond to what Jesus said? Did he have to have faith coupled with obedience to enjoy what the Lord said? Yes, he did. And so listen to what the text said. When, he, when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So it goes back to having enough faith. Maybe I don't necessarily understand. When, when Jesus told Peter to launch out into the deep, I'm sure Peter, thinking from a fisherman's perspective, would say, you know what, that doesn't make any sense at all. Been out here fishing all night long, hadn't caught a thing. But Lord, if that's what you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. And, and so he said, nevertheless, at your word. So when Jesus tells us to do something by faith and obedience, we do it, don't we? Mm -hmm. So you know, like that one of the lessons you get from this is that Jesus was teaching these disciples to trust him. That's right. I mean, there's several lessons, but that's one in particular. And and we have, you know, to, to, if we don't trust in Jesus, we can't call ourselves believers. That's right. Well, you know, one chapter over in Luke 6, in verse 46, you remember Jesus asked the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? 
So if we trust the Lord and we have faith in him, then when he tells us to do something, we're going to do it because number one, we love the Lord and we trust the Lord. And didn't Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we obey the gospel because the Lord instructed us to do so. Mike, where I know you were talking about rushing the time, but but look at verse 47 and how this is like the ending of the Sermon on the Mount. But verse 47 says, everyone, Jesus says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, the New American Standard says, I'll show you whom he's like. And he talks about the man who built his house on the rock versus the man building on the sand. So trusting in Jesus is also acting on what he says. That's exactly that's that's exactly right. It's it's trusting him to the extent that I'm willing to do what he said to do. And really going back to that sermon on the mount what Jesus is saying is a wise person hears his word and acts upon it. As the new as the uh, new american standard says it he does it. He acts on it. He's moved to action. And Roger mentioned a moment ago, Hebrews chapter 11. Go back and read about those people that are listed in that great chapter of faith. Every single one of them did something in connection with his or her faith, didn't they? They were moved to action. So uh, once we once we become a child of God, then the exhortation to us is to be a steadfast, to be steadfast in the faith, to, as uh, Luke said in Acts, 2, in Acts 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So they're going to live a life grounded in the Lord. Once we become a Christian, that's not the end. That's just the beginning, isn't it? Right. So once we become a child of God, we enjoy all these great spiritual blessings. And Paul talks about them in Ephesians 1, verse 3, one of which would be forgiveness or pardon from sin. And Brother Roger, before we close, one of the things that Roger mentioned a moment ago, sometimes people have this idea that they, they just don't think that God would ever be willing to save them because of their life, because of their past life, all the things they've done. And he mentioned Saul of Tarsus. But look over in Hebrews chapter 8. This is not in our lesson. I don't think it's in the, in the lesson text, but you can make a note of it in Hebrews chapter 8 in verse 12. Look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. The writer quotes Jeremiah the prophet who foretold of this new covenant that would be put in force by Jesus. But down in verse seven, down in verse 12, here's what the writer said on behalf of God. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. So when we obey the gospel, whatever is in our past is just that. It's in our past, isn't it? It's all washed away, cleansed. When Saul of Tarsus was instructed by Ananias to arise and be baptized, the purpose was to wash away his sins, Acts 22 at verse number 16. And so what the writer here is saying is all sin, any sin can be forgiven. That gives us hope, doesn't it? Yes. Mike, I was looking, I know hmm. you were talking about finishing up, but those people on Pentecost, when they when they were cut to the heart and asked men and brethren what shall we do we talked about repentance but they also had to be baptized in order to receive the forgiveness of sins too wow. many people want to leave that out of the plan of salvation and you can't leave it out it wasn't left out on pentecost paul didn't leave it out galatians 3:26 and 27 you know, right. you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism is for the remission of sins. We're not earning salvation. It's not a work. 
but it's a response to the gospel. And yet, yet that is when we're forgiven. That's right. And, you know, if you, if you think about what Roger just said, the religious world says you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Jesus said you do. Mark 6, matter of fact, he placed belief and baptism before salvation. Peter put repentance and baptism before salvation. Uh, Ananias put baptism before the washing away of sins. And listen, we can't be a member of the church, the blood-bought body of Christ, unless we're baptized into Christ. Because when we're baptized into Christ, we are automatically, simultaneously added to the body of Christ. Look, uh, since we were in Acts 2, I know our time is gone, but look at Acts chapter 2. You remember in verse 41, the Bible says that those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And down in verse 47, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So here's a question. Who then was in the church? The saved were, weren't they? And had they become saved? They obeyed the gospel. They repented and they were baptized. And then they were added to the church of Christ. Mike, really, this comes back to the foundation of our part of salvation. Faith is more than mental assent. Well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. It also, We have already said this, but again, if I want to ask one, anyone who may be listening that thinks you don't have to do anything, especially you don't have to be baptized because they've been told that's a work. That's not true. But if we really believe, if we really have biblical faith, don't we believe this part about baptism as well? That's Why right. would we not? That's right. Why would we reject that? Um, and anyone who's listening that may not be a part of this class, you're just listening. We urge you seriously to study this because a lot of people say you don't have to do anything. You don't have to be baptized. Uh, you're not earning salvation, but the Bible is clear that you do have to do that. That's right. And, you know, uh, the thought just occurred to me, Roger, when you read Acts chapter 2, think about how different Peter's response was to this question, what must we do to be saved, or what shall we do? What he told them to do, and what the vast majority of the religious world is instructed to do today. Most people in the in the religious world, when they ask the question, what do we need to do? What do people say? Well, accept the Lord Jesus into your heart and then say the sinner's prayer. Well, where'd you ever come up with that? That's not what Peter said. And listen, this is the, Acts chapter two has been called the hub of the Bible. And there's a reason for that. The church began and people were being baptized and added to the church. Now, if the sinner's prayer was a part of Scripture, it'd be here, but it's not. They were told to repent and be baptized. So here's the question. Are we going to believe what Peter, an inspired spokesman, said, or are we going to believe what some preacher in a denomination said? And this falls in line with the Great Commission of what Jesus said. Anything that happened before the Great Commission is irrelevant to what we do after Jesus gave that commission and went back to heaven. That's right. That's right. Anything, the thief on the cross, any of that, that is irrelevant to what Jesus said in the Great Commission. People want to, I, I, I know that a lot of times people want to, uh, they want to, to throw up. Well, what about the thief on the cross? Well, what about the thief on the cross? He died under another, uh, under a different covenant, and and we're under the law of Christ, and so that's like mixing apples and oranges. You can't do that. You got to look at. You've got to look at the context, and there's a difference in what he did and what we're required to do. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess we'll close there. It's a little bit after eleven o'clock our time. Uh, today. And so we're, we've been going 45, 46 minutes. And so in our next, next lesson, we want to look at this chart.
And this is a really, really good chart that you can use to try to teach people the gospel. Uh, and so we're going to go through this chart and spend some time with it. And uh, we'll we'll look forward to being with you again next week. Uh, Brother Roger, you want to close us with prayer today? Yes. Father, we do thank you for being our God. We thank you for your word. May we all seek to listen to you through scripture and obey you so that we can be better servants, better teachers, better Christians. We pray for our students uh, from in the International Academy of Biblical Studies. We pray for anyone watching this online who needs to seriously consider the condition of their soul and their salvation. And we ask that you bless Brother Mike and myself and Sister Nancy and her works with this school that we can do the job that needs to be done to bring glory to your name. We ask this in Christ's name, amen.